I'm a mechanical engineer. I like to build small machines. I like to build small machines that move. This is a magmite. You can see how small it is. About 10 of them are the size of a grain of salt. We, we have a lot of fun with these over the years. We use them to play soccer. We torture ants with them. We made a little Pac-Man maze to drive them through. They're driven by, by oscillating magnetic fields. We think, well, what could you really do useful if you'd made small machines? And Hollywood has answered this question for us back in, in the 1960s when they produced this movie that you probably heard of called Fantastic Voyage. The idea of taking a submarine with four people in it and shrinking it down, injecting it into somebody's body. It's actually a scientist who had a, 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 clot, a blood clot in his brain, and the idea for them was to, to try to remove that blood clot. Now, Hollywood has some advantages we don't have in that they don't have to worry about physics when they come up with their ideas. They don't have to worry what happens when things become small and, and what di what's the difference about the physics. The other thing is Hollywood doesn't have to actually make these things. They don't worry about fabrication and what technologies exist, and we do have to worry about that. To be inspired by, by how to approach this problem, of course we look to nature like a lot of, of folks in engineering do. And, and what you see here on the left are paramecia. They're about the, 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 the width of a hair, and, and you look at the guy on top there, and he's got all these hairs that are, you know, he's, he's avoiding obstacles, he's searching for food, he's very intelligent. He doesn't have a single neuron. But we're inspired by other kinds of microorganisms as well. For instance, this is an E. coli bacteria that's flagellated. And, and these were actually seen back in the 1600s for the first time. And it wasn't, though, until the 1970s when we realized they actually had a rotary motor that was twisting this little flagella that were make, making it propel through, through liquid. And, and so we started looking at that motor and realized the complexity of that. A lot of scientists have studied that for the last several decades. It's made out of about 35 proteins. Now, I don't have the nanotechnology available to me to make that, but I can learn a lot of lessons from how E. coli swim by looking at that flagella and understanding the physics of that. So we leveraged some of our nanotechnology that we had in developing nano ribbons, and we realized those nano ribbons that are about uh, 20 nanometers thick actually look a lot like these flagella. And if we put a little magnet on the end of it and we put it in a rotating magnetic field, it propels itself forward using the identical physics to what a, a, a E. coli uses to swim through, through liquid. We uh, first realized these back in 2007, and here's three of them swimming together. I look at these and they feel like they're alive to me, although I really, I, I know they're not, but there's a certain uh, uh, joy you get in building a machine and, and, and seeing it uh, uh, work in, in, a, in a complicated way. One of the technologies since 2007 that have become available to us is 3D nanoprinting, and that's opened up a whole new possibility now for making micro machines and nano machines, and now we can add new tools to them. We can build a plethora of different kinds of machines. But one of the things we really want to do, though, is take our machines and functionalize them, put chemicals on them uh, to do something. And in this case, what we've done is we've attached DNA to these. And now those, those red uh, dots, those are actually individual cells that are stained. And as we touch those cells and, and remain in contact with them, those cells take up the DNA and start transfecting it, start turning that DNA into a protein to produce a yellow fluorescence. We've also taken 80,000 of these and injected them into a mouse peritoneal cavity and gotten them to swim around. So over the years, we've learned a lot about um, uh, how to use magnetic fields to drive these, um, how to control small things. And so we're thinking about how to move into the clinic. So one of the things we realized was much easier to get into the clinic was is if we actually connected these to a tether so that we could pull them out. And in fact, what we did was we put, just took a, a catheter and put a magnet on the end of it. Um, and then if we put that catheter into the person, we can use some of these lessons about how to guide that catheter very, very precisely, in this case within the heart chamber, to treat a condition uh, known as cardiac arrhythmia, where the heart doesn't beat properly. Now, if we can ablate sections of that uh, heart tissue, we can reset the way the heart beats, and, and the person's heart can beat, uh, uh, beat properly. And so you, you see this very precisely controlled, very tiny millimeter-sized catheter uh, in an animation. But in fact, what we've been able to do is turn this into a, a, a real device. It's in a hospital in Zurich, uh, just outside of Zurich. This is a spin-off company out of my lab. And here we are doing one of our operations on a woman you see in the, by herself. And these are the surgeons right here. They're actually controlling that device literally in the heart of this woman. We're still, though, interested in how to build small machines and how to build, can we ever realize these kinds of complex micro-motors, micro-machines? We learn a lot about nature and uh, are inspired by it and, and continue to move down this path to see, see what, what's the future going to bring here. So thank you very much. <laughs>